Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen. Today I will talk about the Texas Revolution where American colonists in the Mexican state of Texas rose up against the dictator Santa Anna in 1835 and won their independence. But first, I need to give some background. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. Early Spanish explorers had failed to find either gold or silver in Texas, which only received attention when the French began to expand from Louisiana, motivating the Spanish to establish missions along a route from the Rio Grande to East Texas. Actually, the Texan Revolution was not the first time Americans had attempted to take Texas away from Mexico. It was just the first that succeeded. The first attempt was led by Bernardo Guterres de Lara and Augustus McGee to assist the Mexican Revolution against Spain. McGee recruited more than 700 men, including Razambui. The invaders had gained control of part of Texas by September 1812, but McGee's death and Guterres' decision to appoint himself governor of Texas that would be part of a Republic of Mexico, not Louisiana, drove away many recruits. Realizing the need for new leadership, Henry Perry worked with the other American leaders to replace Guterres with José Alvarez de Toledo in August 1813. Two weeks later, Toledo led 1,400 men to face an approaching Spanish army under General Joaquín de Radondo y Minio. Lured into a trap, the rebels were crushed, hundreds of prisoners were executed, and the rest fled back to Louisiana. Arredondo had intended the executions to serve as a warning to deter future filibusters, but he failed. In fact, by December, both John Robinson, a former member of the McGee Guterres expedition, and Toledo were organizing separate expeditions. However, General Jean-Robert Marie Humbert, supposedly sent by Napoleon to start revolts in Mexico to keep Spain busy, was able to attract more support. He also had Good timing, since the smugglers and pirates, loosely led by the Lafitte brothers, were interested in a base in Texas. The Lafittes had given Andrew Jackson enough assistance during the Battle of New Orleans to win a presidential pardon. But hundreds of former smugglers were now sitting around wondering, how were they going to make a living? To be specific, a living that did not involve honest work. Fortunately, financial backing for an expedition was provided by the New Orleans Association, a group of businessmen, lawyers, and planters who hoped to expand into Florida and Texas while Spain was preoccupied with revolts throughout its colonies. The association held meetings with Guterres, Humbert, and Toledo, but progress only started when Henry Perry joined the expedition. By March 1816, Perry had recruited roughly 350 men, through public announcements offering glorious reward for merit, a fancy way of saying all the loot you can carry. This publicity forced President James Madison to make a stern proclamation condemning these filibustering activities. Just a quick explanation. Filibuster means an unofficial military expedition into another country to start a revolution. Surprisingly unmoved by Madison's rhetoric, the expedition proceeded in November, but poor coordination between the various commanders ensured that only a handful of men actually reached Texas. The invasion appeared to have fizzled out until a French privateer named Louis-Michel Ori appeared. Ori had hunted Spanish ships for the South American revolutionaries until he had a disagreement with Simon Bolivar. Working with the association, Ori occupied Galveston, the nearest port outside of American waters, where he was soon joined by Humbert with 150 men. As if there were not enough men with oversized egos elbowing each other for command, yet another commander entered the scene. In November, Francisco Xavier Mina arrived with 140 men, including veteran filibuster Warren Hall. Proving that he was not a team player, Ori declared himself supreme commander and provoked a standoff when he tried to arrest Perry. Somehow, he was persuaded to transport Perry and Mina's men to the mouth of the Rio Santander, but the two men split following a disagreement, and both forces were soon destroyed by Spanish soldiers. Meanwhile, Ori had returned to Galveston to find that Jean Lafitte was using his connection with the association to turn the port into a base for raiding Spanish ships. After most of his men joined the Lafitte's, Ori drifted around the Caribbean until his death four years later. 
Jalifet appear to have gained control of a valuable port, but his dominance of Galveston ended when General Charles Lallemand appeared with a large number of veterans of Napoleon's army in January 18. However, Lallemand's dream of carving out his own nation in Mexico ended when a hurricane destroyed the camp. Lafitte happily transported them back to New Orleans, leaving him free to build Galveston into a thriving port that received goods taken from Spanish ships, which were smuggled to New Orleans. Given their horrible track record, you may ask, why were there so many recruits for these expeditions? Well, the past decade had seen tremendous upheavals. The War of 1812, revolutions throughout Mexico, the Caribbean, Central America, and South America, and the end of the Napoleonic War, a global conflict that had lasted for a generation, had produced many, many men accustomed to violence who were seeking new opportunities. To make matters worse, the border between Louisiana and Texas was unclear. The Treaty of San Ildefenso, which transferred Louisiana to France in October 1800, did not precisely define the western border. Instead, it simply stated that the border was the same as when France had owned it before. When President Thomas Jefferson bought the Louisiana Territory in 1803, he realized that an overly generous redrawing of the border would mean conflict with the Spanish Empire, which was much more powerful than the U.S. at the time. The border remained disputed for years until the adams onis Treaty of 1819 established a 40-mile-wide strip running north and south between the Sabine River on the west and the Calcutchou River on the east as a buffer. Not everyone accepted the treaty. Dr. James Long raised an army to take back what had rightfully belonged to the U.S. until pampered politicians had given it away. Attracting 200 recruits, including Warren Hall, Rezin Bowie's younger brother Jim, and a Kentuckian named Ben Milam, Long led his little army to Nacogdoches, where he declared a republic on June 22, 1819. Long's republic ended on October 26, when a Spanish force arrived and captured 30 of the slowest filibusters, while Long rapidly led the rest back to safety in New Orleans. Threats from Washington forced Jean Lafitte to burn down what was left of his declining base at Galveston and sail off for a final attempt at privateering in April. This should have meant the end of the filibusters, but displaying more perseverance than common sense, Long led less than 50 men on yet another attempt at filibustering in 1821. However, he was soon captured and either died in prison or was murdered, depending on the version of events. Several days after Long's death, Stephen Austin arrived in Mexico City with a different plan for settling Texas. So, why did Austin want to settle Texas? Moses Austin, his father, was a skilled intermediary between the U.S. and Spain, who had received permission to found a colony in Texas to create a buffer between the Comanche and the more settled areas of Texas. However, he died before he could actually start the colony, leaving the task to his son, Stephen. Given the numerous invasions over the course of a decade, it should not be a surprise that the population of Texas had shrunk from 4,000 in 1800 to 2,500 when Austin founded his colony in 1823. What exactly was this new Mexican government? After months of chaos following the overthrow of Augustin de Iturbide, who had led the Mexicans to independence but then made himself emperor, a constitutional congress was held and it decided to merge Texas with its neighbor Coahuila on May 7, 1824, promising that Texas would become a state when it had enough people. Still, the colony had grown to over 1,300 settlers by 1825, so the government in Coahuila permitted other empresarios to build colonies. There would be no lack of colonists. Following the War of 1812, the United States could only expand in two directions, west and south, since the British Army had prevented northern expansion into Canada. Each new frontier attracted a horde of colonists filled with a fever for a land of plenty, and recently invented steamboats made it easier to move people and crops. Mississippi became a state in 1817, followed by Alabama two years later, and Missouri in 1821. To put the flood of immigrants into perspective, Alabama fever caused its population to skyrocket from 10,000 in 1810 to 300,000 in 1830. 
Texas soon filled up with men who had failed back home. In America, clerks would simply write GTT, short for gone to Texas, to close out unpaid accounts. By 1830, the number of Tejanos was 4,000, but the number of American colonists was approaching 30,000. Worried that unrestrained American immigration would transform a Mexican state into an American colony, the Mexican government passed a law on April 6, 1830, that banned further American immigration. This decision directly impacted the settlers' plans because they had expected that they would be followed by more settlers, thus ensuring that their lands would greatly increase in value when the area became civilized. Instead, Texas would remain a frontier. While the law prevented legal immigration, it did not stop thousands of illegal American immigrants from crossing the Sabine River at will. The Mexican government had reacted strongly because the United States' desire to annex Texas was not a secret. When Mexico won its freedom in 1821, the American ambassador's first announcement was an offer to buy Texas for $1 million. Well aware of the value of Texas, the Mexican government refused. After Andrew Jackson became president, he raised the offer to $5 million, but it too was refused. Disappointed, Jackson confided to Colonel Butler, his negotiator, that in time, circumstances might compel us in self-defense to seize that country by force and establish a regular government there over it. Jackson believed with all of the considerable fire in his body that Texas belonged to the United States and he was not bothered by borders. General Jackson had invaded Florida in 1818 while claiming to be in hot pursuit of Indians. When Spain ceded Florida to the U.S. a year later, in exchange for formal recognition that Texas belonged to Spain, it confirmed Jackson's belief in conquer first, then negotiate. Given the numerous attempts to conquer Texas, it should not be a surprise that many former filibusters had settled there. But they had not abandoned their goal of liberating Texas from the rest of Mexico. They called themselves the War Party, but the established colonists did not want to lose their title to their land, and the poor colonists did not trust the War Party, suspecting that their role would be that of cannon fodder. The War Party needed an issue to rally support, and the April 6 law proved ideal, especially since it forced the colonists to pay customs tariffs. Many colonists refused to pay these fees and resorted to smuggling. The War Party successfully linked the tariffs to Britain's Stamp Act, a major cause of the American Revolution, and stirred up control of Colonel Juan Davis Bradburn, a Kentucky-born ex-filibuster who would become commander of the Mexican troops at Anhua, a key smuggling center. An additional factor that fueled discontent was slavery, which had been a key aspect of the colony from the beginning, since a quarter of the first 300 settlers had owned slaves. However, slavery had been abolished in Mexico in 1829, so the April 6 law forbade the importation of slaves, although the state government allowed American immigrants to force their slaves to sign 99-year contracts of indentured servitude. Unlike most of the Mexican commanders in Texas, Bradburn rejected the fiction of 99-year labor contracts and refused to return runaway slaves who reached his jurisdiction, which led to frequent clashes with the lawyers William Travis, a member of the War Party, and his partner Patrick Jack when they represented owners who wanted their property back. When Travis and Jack formed a militia company, the situation quickly degenerated after Bradburn arrested the two men on May 7, 1832. Following numerous confrontations, Mexican troops clashed with men led by Frank Johnson and Warren Hall trying to liberate the two lawyers on June 26. Ten Anglos and five Mexicans died in what appeared to be the first battle of the Texan Revolution. However, the revolution was postponed when Colonel José de las Piedras arrived. Realizing the futility of the situation given the overwhelming Texan numerical superiority, he released the two men and relieved Bradburn of his command. Unfortunately, this praiseworthy restraint simply emboldened the colonists. Less than a month later, an attempt to prevent the formation of militia companies backfired, and Piedras hastily led his garrison out of Nacogdoches. Despite these victories, when the various settler communities gathered to hold a convention in San Felipe on October 1st, 1833, 
The delegates stopped short of declaring independence. Instead, they lobbied for the separation of Texas from Coahuila and the annulment of the April 6th law nominating Stephen Austin to present their demands to Mexico City. One of the delegates to the convention was Sam Houston, former governor of Tennessee. A protégé of Andrew Jackson, Houston had entered Congress in 1823, and after the Jackson machine ensured that Houston was elected governor of Tennessee in 1827, his fortunes continued to rise. His mentor finally became president a year later, and he married 18-year-old Eliza Allen, eldest daughter of a powerful family, in early 1829. However, Houston's life was turned upside down when Eliza left him after three months, and the huge scandal forced him to resign his government, depriving Jackson of a valuable ally and a potential heir. Houston ended up living with old friends among the Cherokee, but his heavy drinking earned him the nickname Big Drunk. Like so many other Americans whose lives had entered a downwards phase, Houston went to Texas in the fall of 1832. Shortly after his arrival, he started telling people about his plans to arrange the American annexation of Texas and then use it as a springboard to become governor, senator, and finally president. This constant boasting was not appreciated by Jackson, who shared his desire to take Texas, but did not want everyone to know. So, how exactly did Santa Ana become a dictator? After leading an army against the dictator President Bustamante that forced him to resign on January 3rd, 1833, Santa Ana won election as president two months later, but left Mexico City to avoid responsibility, especially the need to deal with an overly radical Congress. His vice president, Gomez Farias, became acting head of state and introduced liberal reforms to restrain the power of the army and the Catholic Church. Believing that the reforms had gone too far, Santa Ana returned to Mexico City in May 1834, removed Farias from office, and repealed the liberal reforms. Forming a more conservative government with the support of the church, he closed Congress and ordered the states to disband their militias. Bored by the tedious work of governing, he resigned again, handing over power to trusted supporter Miguel Barragón on January 4th, 1835. Batagon's government then continued the process of centralizing power by replacing the 1824 constitution with a new constitution that ended the autonomy of the states, placing all power in the central government. While Santa Ana was absent from the capital when his government ended the 1824 constitution, he was still the supreme power and he did not stop it. Several states revolted against the dictatorship, which brought him back to the capital not to run the government or stop the changes, but to lead the force to crush the revolt. Zacatetas was chosen as his first target since it was the most powerful of the rebellious states. After his army destroyed the militia in May, he let his troops plunder at will and their brutality resulted in many deaths. So, what has Stephen Austin been doing? A cholera epidemic ensured that it took him five months to arrange a meeting with Santa Ana, who eventually agreed to permit trial by jury, revision of the tariff, and repeal of the immigration law. But he refused to allow a completely separate state constitution since Texas only had half of the minimum 80,000 people required for statehood. Unfortunately, Austin had lost patience during the five months and had written a letter to his supporters in Texas recommending self-government. The letter fell into the hands of Mexican officials, and Austin would spend the next 18 months in prison. Back in Texas, outside events would play a role. Corruption and land speculation in Coahuila State had sunk to such lows that Santa Ana sent his brother-in-law, General Martin Cos, to arrest the speculators and the governor. A number of speculators, including Jim Bowie, Ben Milam, Frank Johnson, and James Grant, tried to stir up the colonists against the threat of martial law, but the established settlers ignored them and continued going about their daily lives. While Jim Bowie is famous for his knife and the Alamo, he should be known for his lengthy career in land fraud. Profits from buying slaves from the Lafitte's and smuggling them through the bayous of Louisiana were used for land speculation. Well, actually land fraud, which was surprisingly common. An overachiever, Jim Bowie falsified such a huge number of land claims in Louisiana that he had to flee to Texas, where he became involved in an attempt to acquire 
half a million acres in Coahuila. Although Santa Ana's decision to repeal the anti-immigration law had calmed the situation in Texas, the colonists' growing dissatisfaction with their status as Mexican citizens and the steady stream of immigrants from America meant that rebellion was inevitable. The only reason why rebellion had not broken out is that it takes two to have a fight, and the Mexican government had been unable to do its fair share since the nation had only recently emerged from its own bloody revolution that had claimed one-sixth of the population. It is important to remember that many recent immigrants to Texas had left the South following the nullification crisis of 1833 when President Jackson had threatened to use the military to force South Carolina to accept tariff legislation that was hated in the state. So these new arrivals were opposed to any form of outside authority. The older established settlers had more to lose, so they were able to limit the aggressive newcomers, at least until the settlers got their hands on a private message from General Koss to the captain of the garrison at Anhuac, saying that troops were coming to occupy Texas and grind the rebels into dust, which destroyed any chance for a peaceful resolution to the conflict. I will discuss the actual revolt in the next episode. Thanks for listening.